But we do want to leave that media conference to take you straight to Sydney, where Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe is talking about the bank's decision. mature over the coming years. These decisions reflect a judgment by the board that it is now time to begin withdrawing some of the extraordinary monetary policy support that was put in place to help the Australian economy during the pandemic. Two considerations are particularly relevant here. The first is that the economy has been very resilient. Unemployment is low and economic growth is expected to be strong this year. The second is that inflation has picked up more quickly and to a higher level than we had expected and there is now evidence that labour costs are increasing more quickly. In these circumstances, the board judged that it was now appropriate to start the process of normalising monetary policy in Australia. I acknowledge that the increase in interest rates comes earlier than the guidance that the bank was providing during the dark days of the pandemic. During that period, and especially in 2020, the national health situation was precarious, the economic outlook was dire, and it was clouded by a lot of uncertainty. The board wanted to do everything it could in those circumstances to help get the country through that difficult period. In those unprecedented times, we judged that the economic damage from the pandemic was likely to require that interest rates remain low in Australia for years. As things have turned out, though, the economy has been much more resilient than we had expected, which is clearly very welcome news. The combination of fiscal and monetary support has worked, and the development of vaccines in record times has allowed our society to return to more normal functioning more quickly than we had expected. Australians have also proven to be resilient, and we have adapted well to our changed circumstances. <coughs> As a result of these developments, unemployment now stands at 4%. It's expected to decline over the rest of this year to around 3.5% at the end of the year and into next year. If so, that would be the lowest rate in almost 50 years. It's a remarkable achievement. Labor force participation has also risen to a record high and a higher share of the working age population has a job today than ever before. The economy is also expected to grow strongly this year, with the Reserve Bank's central forecast being for GDP growth of a little above 4% this year. This resilience of the economy means that the record low interest rates are no longer required. The other major development has been on the inflation front. Over the year to the March quarter, CPI inflation was 5.1%, and in underlying terms, inflation was 3.7%. These numbers are lower than the inflation rates in most other advanced economies, but they are higher than we have experienced for many years, and they are higher than we were expecting. The main driver of the higher inflation has been global developments with a series of major global supply shocks pushing prices up over the past year. The pandemic has interrupted supply chains and it continues to do so with the recent lockdowns in some of the large Chinese cities again disrupting production and transport. And on top of this, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has resulted in sharp increases in the price of oil and gas, of base metals and of many agricultural commodities. Inevitably, these shocks to global prices do flow through into higher inflation in Australia. But the higher inflation outcomes have a domestic component as well. There are a number of areas where strong demand is now putting pressure on available capacity, with many firms reporting that it's quite difficult to hire workers with the right skills. This pressure on capacity is reflected in the broadening of the areas in which prices are rising more quickly than they have over recent years. Firms in a range of industries are now indicating that they are prepared to pass on cost increases through into higher consumer prices. Looking forward, we expect a further increase in the inflation rate as the effects of global developments wash through the year-ended inflation figures. But we then expect inflation to start receding as some of the supply disruptions are resolved and 
as prices settle at a higher level. I think it's important to remember that for inflation to stay high, prices need to keep increasing at a fast rate, not just settle at a higher level. And offsetting influence to the resolution of some of these supply side problems will be stronger growth in labour costs in a tight labour market. Our central forecast, which is based on an assumption of further interest rate increases, is that underlying inflation will decline to the top of the target band in 2024. But if interest rates were to remain unchanged, inflation would be higher than this, perhaps substantially higher. Over recent years, the Board has placed considerable emphasis on trends in growth in labour costs when making its decisions. This is because over the medium term, there is a strong link between the inflation rate and the rate of growth in labour costs. Given that we operate a flexible medium term inflation target, we are generally prepared to look through year to year variability in the inflation rate caused by supply, shy, supply side developments or exchange rate movements. This is because if these shocks do not flow through into a permanent change in the growth of labour costs, inflation should return to the lower rate once the supply side shock washes through. But if the supply side shocks do lead to a permanent or a persistent shift in labour cost growth, inflation will not return to where it was before so there can be path dependence in the inflation rate based on the supply side shock. This focus on trends in labour costs has been evident in the Board's communication over recent meetings, including last month, when we stated that over coming months we would be assessing important additional evidence on both inflation and the evolution of labour costs before deciding on interest rates. The evidence that we have received on inflation since then has been clear. Inflation has been high, and it's been higher than we were expecting. On labour costs, while the various data for the March quarter compiled by the ABS have not yet been released, other evidence received over the past month through our business liaison and through business surveys has indicated that there is now stronger upward pressure on labour costs and that this is likely to continue. And we expect to see this in the ABS data over the period ahead. In a tight labour market, some firms are paying higher wages to attract and retain staff. This is especially so given the higher inflation rate and the fact that workers are experiencing cost of living pressures. So firms are responding to these developments. There is still considerable inertia in the wages system from multi-year enterprise agreements and the current public sector wage policies, but the direction of change is now clear. Given this evidence on inflation and on wages, and the very low interest, the level of interest rates in Australia, the Board decided that now was the right time to start the process of normalising interest rates. We also decided that we would not reinvest the proceeds of maturing government bonds. This means that our bond holdings and our balance sheet will decline as the bonds mature. Our balance sheet will also decline substantially in 2023 and 2024 as banks repay the funding made available under the term funding facility. This contraction of our balance sheet will contribute to some tightening of financial conditions in Australia and so it will assist with the return of inflation to target. The Board currently has no plans to sell the government bonds that it's purchased during the pandemic and it intends to allow the portfolio of bonds to run down in a predictable way as the bonds mature. This decision to proceed with quantitative tightening does not rule out a return to quantitative easing sometime in the future should circumstances require that. Given the outlook for the economy and for inflation, further normalisation of interest rates will be required. In making its decisions, the Board will continue to be guided by the evidence on both inflation and labour costs. We'll also continue to be reflexible and responsive to changing circumstances. We will do what is necessary to ensure that the inflation outcomes are consistent with the medium-term inflation target. 
This does not require an immediate return of the inflation rate to target because our monetary policy framework intentionally allows for flexibility and for some variability of inflation from year to year. But we do need to ensure that the inflation rate does track back towards the 2 to 3 per cent target. I think this would be harder to achieve if the inflation psychology in Australia were to shift in a durable way due to the recent higher inflation outcomes. The decision to move today rather than wait should help on this front. In making our decisions over coming months, we need to navigate through some considerable uncertainties. Globally, it remains uncertain about how the supply side problems will resolve and it's still very uncertain how the situation in Ukraine will develop. Another source of uncertainty is how household spending in advanced economies responds to the decline in real wages, as wages growth in most countries has not kept pace with the high rate of inflation. Also, we have no contemporary experience to guide us with how labour costs and prices in Australia will, be will behave at an unemployment rate below 4%. It's also relevant that households have much more debt than previously, and many households have never experienced a rise in interest rates. So this is another aspect that we'll be watching very carefully over the months ahead. Notwithstanding these uncertainties, I expect that further increases in interest rates will be necessary over the months ahead. The board is not on a preset path and it will be guided by the evidence and the data as it takes the necessary steps to achieve the medium term inflation target and support full employment in Australia. Thank you very much for listening and I'd be happy to take your questions. Mr. Lai, you're usually Thank you. Sorry, same. could you wait for just one minute? Oh, sorry. We're just going to tell everybody on the line how to handle this. Thank you. I will now move to the Q&A. Please raise your hand if you're in the room with a question and um, we'll uh, assign you at that time. And if you're on the line, please press star one to join the queue. Could everyone please limit themselves to one question and one follow-up if needed and we'll start with some questions in the room. So, uh, actually, we'll start with Hayley Francis from Channel 9, if that's okay. Uh, can you tell us how much is the election weighed into today's decision? Uh, the election has no influence at all on today's decision. Uh, the Reserve Bank has given, been given a mandate by Parliament that is to achieve uh, price stability, full employment and to promote the economic welfare of the Australian people. We have operational independence and it's testimony to the political culture in Australia that that independence is respected we take our decisions in the best interests of the country and that's what we always do and that's what we did today and we do that without any interference from politics and we don't take the political situation into account. We do what we think is right for the country. Next question. Uh, this is Robert Evarts from Channel 7. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, spiralling labour costs, the correlation with inflation and the uncertainty of what's happening in the Ukraine at the moment and supply from, from COVID. So all of those don't work particularly well. You also mentioned the term medium term. Can you define what medium term is, please? So there are, when you talk about a number of rate rises over the coming months, can Australians expect uh, a quarter rise every single time the RBA is going to meet over the next six months or so? What sort of increase are we, are we talking here? Keeping in mind you aren't gun-shy about predictions given what's happened. Well, I obviously don't want to kind of predict what the board's going to do over the coming months. But I think what I can say is that the midpoint of our inflation targeting band is 2.5%. I've said previously that I would expect that at some point in the future that interest rates would get back to that level. So after all, that would mean the inflation-adjusted interest rate was zero. I hope actually over time we can do better than that, but that would require stronger productivity growth in Australia. But over time it's not unreasonable to expect that the interest rates would get back to 2.5%. How quickly we get there, and indeed if we get there, will be determined by the, how events unfold. Uh, we're going to be, uh, as we have been up until very recently, guided by the evidence. And we'll d it will depend upon how the resolution of the various uncertainties that you just cited um, uh, occurs. Uh, we've got an open mind. We've been um, over the past two years very flexible. We've changed in response to the changing circumstances and we'll continue to do that. But it's not unreasonable to expect 
that the normalization of interest rates over the period ahead uh, could see interest rates rise to 2.5%. That would be a more normal level of interest rates. And how fast we get there and whether we get there is going to be determined by events. Follow-up question. Um, have there been, has there been even one phone call from any tier of government or the opposition in relation to your decision today? No. Uh, as I um, said before, it is a testimony to the political culture in Australia that the Reserve Bank can take its decisions completely independently of politics. We make decisions uh, in the national interest. I know those decisions are not always popular. Uh, they're contested, and in some cases they're controversial. But the government of the day appoints nine Australians to make those decisions, and we take them uh, in the national interest with no politi uh, political interference, and we don't take account of politics in making those decisions either. It's, it really is testimony to our political culture that that can be the case, and that's not the case in every other country, obviously. Question from the room. Uh, this is Ed Boyd from Sky News. Governor, do you believe you're behind the curve and you've come to this cash rate rise a bit too late? With soaring inflation across the economy, will you admit that you're playing catch up now? I don't uh, see it in those terms that we're playing catch up, but uh, I do see it in that we need to normalise interest rates. Uh, we have said right through the pandemic we would wait for the evidence on both inflation and wages. Uh, we intentionally did that because we wanted to get out of the low inflation years that we'd been in previously. We made a commitment to wait for the evidence. That evidence is now upon us. It was clearly there in the CPI and the evidence on wages is there in our liaison. I think we'll see it in the published data over the, over the uh, coming months. Having got that evidence, it's appropriate to move and we will move to normalise interest rates and I expect to see further increases over the months ahead. But we wanted to wait for the evidence. That was a conscious decision we made. And I know when you're waiting, people will say sometimes that, well, you waited too long. And um, people will make that point. But we wanted to wait for the evidence. And as soon as we've seen the evidence, we've moved. And Governor, just as a follow-up, how long is it going to take for the cash rate to get to that 2.5% level? How far off are we talking? Well, it's a very good question. And um, I, I don't want to um, make a prediction on that for you. It will depend upon how these various issues resolve. It's quite possible that the supply side issues resolved, and even if, the, say, for the price of oil, it stays where it is, then the inflation rate in oil prices becomes zero. It was 35 per cent. The oil price were up 35 per cent over the past year. If the oil price stays where it is, that'll be zero next year. The price of home building is up 13.5 per cent over the past year. So the cost of building new homes up a long way quite possible that it continues to rise, but probably not at another 13%. So there are reasons to believe that inflation will start moderating, but um, on the other hand, the labour market's tightening. So it's difficult at the moment to predict for you how those uh, factors are going to play out, but I, the main point is that it is time to normalise rates. We don't need these emergency settings anymore. With an unemployment rate of 4% and probably likely to get, go lower, and economic growth this year of 4%. We don't need these emergency settings anymore. And it's, it's good news. I know many people don't like ri rising interest rates, but it's a reflection of the underlying strength of the economy that we can move up these emergency settings. Next question from David Chow from the ABC. Uh, Governor, so it was only a month ago the RBA reassured uh, you know, the public that rates are unlikely to rise until 2024, and then more recently it's plausible they might rise this year, and indeed there was a rate hike today. So you know, no doubt many borrowers relied on the RBA's previous guidance and took up massive debts to get into the property market in reliance on the fact that it might not rise till 2024, uh, but you know, I guess they're in the unfortunate predicament that house prices are starting to fall and they may fall into negative equity, especially in Sydney, Melbourne and those expensive market. So I guess uh, what would the Reserve Bank say you know, to those borrowers you know, who I guess were listening to the guidance of the Reserve Bank which has changed you know, rather quickly in a short amount of time? Uh, we've certainly changed the guidance and we've changed it because the economic circumstances have changed. Um, nobody predicted, uh, at least to my knowledge, that we would be looking at the lowest unemployment rate in decades now. You might recall that during the dark days of the pandemic, through much of 2020, people were talking about an unemployment rate in Australia of 15%, that there would be deep scarring that would take 
many, many years to overcome. So that was the situation that people were thinking through 2020. Fortunately, things have worked out much better than that, which means that we don't need these very low level of interest rates um, that we thought we would need. And um, I know it's coming as a shock to many people, but it's, it's a testimony to the resilience of the economy and the fact that more Australians have jobs today than ever before. I think the other thing, um, the other point I would make is that Australians have understood that interest rates would go up at some point. None of us understood really at what point that would, would, would be, but I think we all understood that at some point interest rates would go up. They didn't know when, but they knew they would go up, and they responded appropriately. Over the past couple of years, households have saved an extra $240 billion over and above what they otherwise would have saved. They've squirrelled that away. It's in um, bank accounts, and the average owner-occupier with a mortgage is more than two years ahead of their mortgage repayments. Back in 2018, they're only one year ahead. So they've saved a lot of extra money, uh, and uh, they're ahead. many people are ahead of their mortgages. Loan arrears at the moment are very low. So people have understood that interest rates would go up, it's happening earlier than I expected, and I'm sure it's happening earlier than many borrowers expected, but I think we all knew that interest rates couldn't stay at this current level forever, and many people have saved in advance of that day, and I think that's very sensible behaviour. All right, well, welcome back to Afternoon Briefing. Greg Jennett and Fran Kelly with you. We're coming from our Parliament House studios here in Canberra. That's the Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe having already announced fairly succinctly and clearly the reasons for today's official interest rate rise and also stating the uh, independence of the Reserve Bank has been upheld by making that decision in the midst of a highly contested federal election campaign. So, yep, yeah, that's in summary uh, his statement. Fran has an interview to get to with a time-poor politician. So, Fran, let's hand straight over to you now. Yeah, let's come to reaction to the Reserve Bank Governor's decision or the Reserve Bank's decision today to lift rates by... Um, uh 25 basis points. I'm joined now by the shadow finance spokesperson, Katie Gallagher. Katie, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Fran. Uh, Senator, you heard the Reserve Bank Governor there. The reason the board has lifted rates today is because basically the Australian economy is resilient. He cited the low unemployment rate of 4% and heading down to historic levels, uh, uh, record labour participation rates. He's straighted, forecasting strong growth of 4.25% this year and also the intelligence for the bank is that wages have risen, are rising, are on the rise. That's not a picture of economic mismanagement, is it? Well, we certainly welcome uh, low unemployment and the fact that the bank's um, intelligence from business and others are, are that wages are starting to move. Uh, but I think, you know, from our point of view and from the campaign's point of view, the issue really is that escalating cost of living, wages not keeping up, and now households having to you know, handle increasing interest rates. So, um, you know, we, we don't discount um, low unemployment. We want it as low as it can go, but there are real pressures on households. Uh, and as of today, there's going to be more pressure on those households. And, and that's a real issue in this campaign and a real issue of credibility for Scott Morrison, well, I think. Let me give you another quote from the Reserve Bank Governor. He said, the combination of fiscal and monetary policy during the pandemic has worked. It's a vote of confidence in the government's handling of the economy, isn't it? And we've been reasonable and responsible during the pandemic around supporting both the fiscal, uh, well, the fiscal and monetary policy working together in support of Australian jobs and supporting Australian households through the global pandemic. But I think the statement also goes to some of those domestic issues, uh, which we have been critical of the government of in terms of being able to respond uh, to some of the pressures that households are, are experiencing and some of those capacity constraints that the bank has acknowledged today. And this is where we think the the government has dropped the ball, whether it be in skills, um, encouraging more people back to work with the childcare settings. These are all areas we think we need a long-term plan for. And indeed, in the statement today, 
you know, the banks predicting going back to low, t low growth uh, scenario just in the next year or so. So I, I don't think we can just say everything's going brilliantly. Um, there are strengths in our economy, but there are significant challenges that whoever wins the election is going to have to respond to post May 21st. OK, but in whether you can, on the question of whether you can sort of hang this interest rate rise on the government's net in the middle of an election campaign, isn't the truth about this rate rise today that it would have happened no matter who was in government? It had to happen. We had to get off the floor of emergency rate rises. Well, again, we have been very reasonable in terms of accepting the independence of the Reserve Bank to set uh, the cash rate. Uh, but we, you know, when if you want to uh, look at what the Prime Minister said in November last year, it was blaming Labor for rising interest rates and rising cost of petrol and all the things that uh, he's now walking away from. So I think uh, the job that the government's got and their sort of economic credibility in tatters is because of things they've said in the past and things that are occurring now for households and the pressure households are under and the fact that they don't have a long-term plan to deal with it. They might have a short-term plan to get past the next election, but when we look at the long-term investments that are needed in the economy, this government uh, walks away from having any responsibility for it. OK, but for voters who are trying to make an assessment of how to vote in this election campaign, they're looking at rates, they've heard the Reserve Bank Governor, the message from the Governor is the bank will move to normalise rates. In other words, rates will keep rising until effectively they get into that the band of two and a half percent. So no matter who's in government, rates are going to keep rising. Labor won't be able to do anything about that. Would you? Well, we accept, again, the independence of the Reserve Bank to make those, in, those decisions in the interests of the economy and the country. Um, and we haven't pretended that, um, you know, it's a political party that determines this. It's the Prime Minister who's done that in the past. But, again, I would go back to the fact that, um, you know, if you talk to people out on the streets, the issue that, uh, that is hitting the hip pockets is that the rising costs of everything is not keeping up with wages and this government has kind of vacated the field and that is the area that we want to focus on and that's the area our policies are focused on, on skills, childcare, making things here, all of the areas that are going to be challenges um, post May and this government doesn't have a plan well, on it. Well, let's go to that because the Shadow Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, said earlier and he said it a number of times, the Morrison government has an excuse but it hasn't got a plan. It's got mm -hmm. an excuse for everything and a plan for nothing. So what is your plan to address the inflationary pressures, um, growth and the impact of inf interest rate rises. Yeah, so uh, all of our key policies are about investing in the productive uh, side of the economy and encouraging growth, whether we look at uh, childcare, uh, cleaner and cheaper energy, uh, more making things here, our investment in skills for the new jobs of the future. All of those are areas that we have policies on and, and go right to the heart of driving growth uh, beyond the election cycle. We also have uh, these investments that are not inflationary. They invest in the productive side of the economy. Uh, and we've been very modest in terms of our budget strategy. You know, we don't want to add um, to inflationary pressures. That's why our policies are focused on those other areas, as I've just outlined. All right, I know you've got election commitments Sorry. you need to run. Can I just ask you finally whether Labor's going to have to rewrite its main slogan for this campaign, which is everything's going up except for your wages. The Reserve Bank governor's told us quite clearly they've got plenty of intelligence that wages are on the rise. Yeah, and we welcome that. Uh, but, look, we've had 10 years almost of stagnant wages and a fall in real wages. So even if there is movement, and we hope that there is, I think most, most households will still be behind because the cost of everything is going up faster than wages and it's going to take a while to catch up. But we want to see long-term sustainable and responsible wages growth because that's the key to supporting households through what's going to be a pretty difficult time. Katie Gallagher, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Fran. Well, it's been a frenetic afternoon of economic debate ever since at the tick of 2.30 Eastern Time, the Reserve Bank released its decision to the surprise of some, not, Fran, that they have actually increased interest rates, but uh, the emphatic way in which they did it, the, the margin. Yeah, it was a tick otherwise. higher. It was a tick higher. Everyone thought it would go up to 25 basis points, but in fact they added 25 basis points, so it's a little higher. And I think the Reserve Bank Governor making it clear there, Greg, there'll be a series of rises in quite quick succession, I think. I mean, I think as many economists have suggested we might see another rate rise next month. I think 
yeah. that's in line with the soundings of the Reserve Bank Governor. Well, it does sound inevitable. The timing is the only question that remains outstanding. And yet its intersection with this federal election campaign becomes the interesting point because listening to your interview there with Katie Gallagher but also to Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg before it, it doesn't seem to have greatly rattled the, the dynamics of the debate, the, the, the speaking points, if you like. No, the speaking points are the same. The government's sticking to its line. This is international factors and they've got some cover for that from the comments from the Reserve Bank Board and the Governor there that the uncertainty of global uh, impacts like the U situation in Ukraine, for instance, yep. but also we're in this weird environment where employment keeps getting lower and wages growth has been slower and they're wondering too how people are going to, mortgage holders are going to react to many of them having their first interest rate rises ever. So the Reserve Bank's got a lot of sure. issues to look at. It here. does and we can pull that apart a little further but why don't we just recap now and we'll jump back to Scott Morrison, he was speaking in Melbourne just a little earlier. Now I know Australians would be saying, well, what's happening in the UK, in the United States and in Canada and Germany and France, what good is that to me if my prices are going up? Well, what that shield has done has ensured that what others are experiencing in other countries has not happened to the same extent here. Those 8.5% inflation rates in the United States could have been here. Those almost 7% inflation rates in New Zealand could have been here. All of those pressures that have had those more serious impacts in other countries, just like the death rates from COVID that were overseas, all could have happened here. The shield that we have put in place through our strong economic plan has prevented that from occurring. And it is true that, of course, a 25 basis point increase in the cash rate, of course, for those who will be paying more, that will be harder. And we understand that. That's why tax reduction has been a key objective of our government and is ongoing. That is why supporting businesses who themselves face higher rates now as a result of this have been supported with increased tax deductions in the most recent budget and ongoing support. It is all being about having a strong economic plan that understands the global environment in which we're operating. And Greg, Shadow Treasurer Jim Chalmers knew some kind of decision would be made today, so he placed himself here in Parliament House in Canberra in anticipation of today's announcement. Yeah, Jim Chalmers, Bank. that's right, Fran. He uh, emerged within an hour, I think it was, of the decision being made public to perhaps not unexpectedly, sheet blame home to the Morrison government's economic management, describing its credibility as not only, quote, in tatters, but now shredded. This is a full-blown cost of living crisis on Scott Morrison's watch, and now interest rate rises are about to be part of the pain. Now, this Prime Minister has an excuse for everything and a plan for nothing. When things are going well in the economy, he takes all of the credit. And when times are tough in the economy, he takes none of the responsibility. Now, he was speaking today about a shield. The only shield that Scott Morrison is interested in is to shield himself from the blame and to shield himself from people who are doing it tough. Now, he asked in his press conference earlier today, what would Labor not have him do? Well, Labor wouldn't have had him waste $20 billion of JobKeeper for businesses that were already profitable and didn't need it. Labor wouldn't have had him waste $5.5 billion on submarines that will never be built, a $1 billion on publicly funded political advertising to tell everyone how good he's going. We wouldn't have wasted $660 million on car parks, many of them that wouldn't be built, a tenth of that money for car parks in the Treasurer's own electorate. If only you could pay your mortgage with Scott Morrison's excuses. This is a tough day for Australians. This is another aspect of Scott Morrison's triple whammy uh, in his cost of living crisis, falling real wages, rising interest rates and inflation spiralling out of control. Well, of course, there will be implications from today's Reserve Bank Board decision for people with mortgages, that is borrowers, typically upwards of $50 a month. This, after all, is the first rates rise in more than 10 years, with the Reserve Bank saying it is the right time to begin withdrawing stimulus from the economy. Financial Services Minister Jane Hume discussed all of this when she joined us just a short time ago. 
Jane Hume, thanks for joining us on Afternoon Briefing. The Coalition, the Morrison government, chose economic management as its key campaign theme. So has the Reserve Bank today derailed that campaign? Greg, if you're a mortgage holder like I am, of course any interest rise is not the best news for your hip pocket. But at the same time, I think most Australians recognised that a, a, rate in, a rate rise was probably an inevitability. Uh, we've had record low interest rates for the last 18 months. They were put in place to manage a crisis, a health crisis as well as an economic crisis. But now, as we emerge of the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic, at some stage, those rates were going to have to normalise. And this is the step that the Reserve Bank has taken today. Obviously, the Reserve Bank is entirely independent of government. And when it makes these decisions, it takes into account all sorts of information, not just the inflation rate, which, of course, is running at 5.1%, uh, but also things like wage rises and whether some of those cost of living pressures that we're seeing from things like fuel, um, fuel price rises and, uh, and you know, freight mm. costs, uh, whether those are permanent or whether those are uh, or structural or whether they are transient yeah. uh, in nature. But okay. that's what the Reserve Bank has decided today. Well, we understand, of course, it's independence and, I suppose, the inevitability of a return to normality. But what about the appropriateness of recent government settings? So the Prime Minister has spoken about putting up a shield in the form of supports and spending, particularly, as you say, on cost of living. But might that shield have inadvertently become an explosive in itself behind this economy, fueling inflation and overcooking the temperature generally? Note the government's responses have been very measured and responsible and targeted in their approach. In fact, in this year's budget, we saw an improvement to the budget bottom line of around $103 billion. That's the appropriate response to ensure that you keep inflation and interest rates under control domestically. More importantly, we provided uh, around $8 billion in very targeted and very specific uh, cost of living measures, uh, things like cutting the, t the fuel excise, by 22%. That actually has a deflationary uh, effect. Uh, we've also provided $250 payments to pensioners and yes. to other concession card holders and also $1,500 in a low and middle income tax offset to low and middle income earners. Right, on but specifically that, on course, that last point, can I just interrupt yes. you there? Sorry, Jamie, there's a little bit of delay yes. here. But with the low and middle income tax offset, that money hasn't even landed in the national economy yet. It will in the September quarter. And we've already got the Reserve Bank warning us about domestic capacity strengths. The domestic side of the inflation story is, you know, growing in its view. So it can only get worse if that money lands and it appears that it might at, at a time of great heat in the economy. Well, those low- and middle-income earners, that's people earning less than $126,000 a year, are, are probably the ones that feel the cost of living pressures the most. Those cost of living pressures take up a large proportion of the household budget for low- and middle-income earners, so that's why relief is being given to where it's needed the most. We don't think this will fuel inflation, quite the contrary. It will be a relief to people who are feeling the pinch right now. But more importantly, we've also been delivering cost, uh, cuts to the costs of medicines or cost to the, the, to the PBS, uh, changing the thresholds of the PBS to allow for free scripts sooner and also changes to uh, expansions to the concession card, uh, the, help, the Commonwealth uh, Seniors Concession Card uh, and that will of course give discounts for things like utility bills as well for senior Australians. This is where a targeted and a responsible cost of living relief can be provided by government. What about the underlying story of the strength of the economy here though, Jane Hume? Your own budget has the next financial year clicking along at three and a quarter percent. The Reserve Bank reminds us today that for calendar year next year it sees the potential for only two percent. There's a rather more bleak outlook coming from the Independent Reserve Bank here today isn't there in a, a fairly unusual statement. Greg, that's why the coalition government delivered a long-term economic plan as part of this year's budget that will deliver an additional 1.3 million jobs into the economy, keeping those unemployment rates low at 4% 
or lower. Uh, you know, giving more jobs to people, more certainty around their employment makes, makes it just that little bit easier when the cost of living rises. It gives you more certainty and allows you to plan uh, for the future. Uh, most importantly, we've in included in that long-term economic plan uh, uh, um, components to improve productivity measures, things like uh, the digital economy strategy, the modern manufacturing strategy, the defence plan. All of these things will turbocharge economic growth and improve the economy's capacity to grow. Yeah. Left hanging in the Reserve Bank statement today, Senator, was you know, what this pathway back to normality for interest rates might actually look like at the end of, I think the Prime Minister used the word, a journey uh, towards normality. Uh, either before or during caretaker, are you, the government, privy to the best Treasury estimates on where this journey ends? I note that some economists are saying we'll be at 1.25 per cent official cash rate rate uh, by early next year. Well, the Reserve Bank's decisions are always independent of government, Greg, and that's a really important distinction to make. The most important thing is that the coalition government is delivering a long-term economic plan to ensure that Australia will continue to grow in the future, that unemployment rates are kept low, that we maintain our AAA credit rating, which is essentially the international tick of approval for your economic management, and that we continue to ensure that Australians are enjoying a high standard of living and that their cost of living is maintained. Right. Uh, the cost of living doesn't blow out through those targeted and responsible measures. Yes, but if cost of living pressure is severe now, and everyone's acknowledging that it is, uh, the bleak news in today's development from the Reserve Bank is it's only going to get worse, isn't it, over at least the next 12 months? Well, we would expect that there would potentially be further rate rises should inflation stay high. We want inflation to re return to that band of 2 to 3 per cent of normal inflation. That's the RBA's objective. The good news is because of the coalition government's economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic, there's now around $250 billion worth of savings that are sitting on household balance sheets. Uh, we know that people have built a buffer into their home loans and to their mortgages so that they won't necessarily feel the immediate pinch of a rate rise. But most Australians expected that rate rise, so they've built it, they've factored it into sure. their plans. Now, is it good news for your average mortgage holder today? Well, it's probably not what they wanted to hear, but I don't think it's a surprise to anybody. And most Australians have factored that in already. Yeah, that may well be the case. And just finally, Jane Hume, on the flip side of that, house prices, we do know that Reserve Bank official interest rate movements have a general intention to, to to cool housing price pressure, could people reasonably expect that their house values might actually dip because of this journey that we're now on? What? Greg, I think we've already seen a flattening out of, of housing prices and we would expect the market to cool somewhat. That said, we don't want to see house prices uh, tumble, certainly. Uh, the vast majority of Australian households own their own home. Uh, they have a lot of wealth invested into their own home and we wouldn't want to see that be diminished. Uh, and certainly our economic responses are there to make sure that because people are still employed, because the economy is strong, that the economy is ticking on and, uh, and, and house prices will continue to remain steady and grow at a steady rate. That's, I think, what everybody wants to see. Yep, a bit to confront no matter who uh, wins the election on the 21st of May. Jane Hume, thanks again for joining us on Afternoon Briefing today. Great to be with you, Greg. Well, we've now edged past the halfway mark of this election campaign and according to the polls, and there's been a few of them this week, the primary vote of both the major parties is stuck in the mid to low 30s and there's very little movement. To assess what that means, I'm joined now by Tony Mitchellmore, founder of Visibility Consulting and Peter Lewis, director of Essential Media. Welcome both of you. Hi, Fran. Well, we've got this rate rise in the middle of an election campaign. It's the first time interest rates have gone up in 11 years. The Prime Minister, we just heard Jane Hume there saying this rate rise won't be a surprise to anyone. Peter Lewis, let me start with you. How do you think it's going to play into the electorate? Do you think it's going to change the polls setting? I think it reinforces what's coming through as by far the, the top issue for voters 
which is cost of living. And the interesting data point we've been picking up in our Guardian Essential report is that Labor's opened up a 10-point lead in the party most trusted to handle cost of living issues. So I don't think it changes the election, but I think it reinforces battle lines in a way that I don't think the Morrison government planned. They wanted an election fought on either national security or national economy. They've kind of had a bit of both coming out over the last week, but it hasn't shifted the poll numbers and it's actually reinforcing that the opposition is more trusted on that issue, particularly the um, cost of living issue. Tony, you deal around kitchen tables with focus groups, so you're doing qualitative polling. Um, we, as I say, this rate rise, the Reserve Bank Governor has told us today it's not unreasonable to expect rates will rise ultimately to 2.5%, not giving us the time frame for that. How do you see this rate rise playing into the sentiment of voters? Uh, I don't think it helps the government. Uh, their narrative is all about we've come through these unprecedented times and we've been strong and the economy has stayed strong. Um, and who knows what the future holds, and so stick with us in, in uncertain times. I just think it's, it sullies that, um, you know, that we're strong, that the economy is good. It sullies that whole story a little bit. And if their message is about we're in control, you can trust the grown-ups in the room, we, we, we can handle this. This interest rate rise suggests that things are, are maybe a little bit out of control um, and hurts their narrative a little bit. Well, the, the Prime Minister has made a point of saying that the Australian mortgage holders, the Australian electorate, is smart, they know what's going on. The Reserve Bank Governor made a similar comment, like people understand what this is about, they, it's not unexpected, it won't be a shock to anybody. But for those that you've been listening to, Tony, do you think this will be a shock to them? Um, maybe not a shock. I do think people knew it was coming, um, but there'll be dread about it and it's what peter said cost of living is the big issue of the campaign especially with swinging voters um, and they're the people who matters matter um, and this just gives them a greater sense of dread about how am i going to get by how am i going to pay things things are going to get more expensive um, and when you undermine cost when when cost of living gets greater you undermine the economic credentials of of, of the government which have generally been um, superior to labor um, Peter, it's on the government's territory, as you mentioned. They want it on national security, they want it on the economy. Well, I've certainly got that today uh, with this rate decision. That's all anyone's going to be talking about. But what about the potential for this to hurt Labor in terms of the Prime Minister's main message right through this campaign, which is Labor is a risk. Don't risk them with the economy in uncertain times. I yeah, mean, this... is, 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 are your polls showing up anything on that front? Look, I think a, a, a telling indicator, we ask a question, do you think the country's heading in the right direction or the wrong direction? Um, right direction, if it was a candidate, has deteriorated 10% over the past um, four weeks since the campaign started. So to run a don't risk change really requires people saying that the current situation is one that they want to sign up to more of. Um, the Prime Minister's proposition, better the devil you know, in implies that you may not like me, but the alternative is worse. But it really requires a solid state. And what I'm picking up in our numbers is people are starting to vote against status quo, not because they want radical change, but just because what they're being offered and what is rolling out um, in terms of national security, um, mistakes in, in the Pacific, in terms of you know, the lived experience of prices going up and the wage issue, no movement, they are all contributing to a sense that, you know, what was at the beginning of this year a sense we're basically heading in the right direction is now stopping and there is a sense that I pick up, and it's too early, I'm not predicting what happens over the next few weeks because, remember, we've still got 6% uncommitted and another 20-odd percent who say they could well change their vote, but the settings are in place for... Um, 
people to vote to change government, I think, in a few weeks' time. Tony, back to your swinging voters who you listen to. When we spoke to you in the first week of this campaign, you talked about the mood of the electorate was sort of grumpy and cranky and unhappy after mm -hmm. the pandemic. But you also yeah. implied that was a little, and people didn't like Scott Morrison, is what you said, but there was also mm -hmm. a sense of, but do we trust this other guy who we don't know very well mm -hmm. not to stuff up the economy, basically? I mean, is that yeah. sentiment still there and might that work as a negative for Anthony Albanese with this decision? It, it, look, it is. Um, look, I feel like the mood has changed a bit. We're, we're, we're coming out of COVID now and uh, people aren't quite as cranky and they're back to kind of more of a, a, a normal sort of situation. Um, uh, so, so that has changed. But what hasn't changed is still a decent rump of people amongst swinging voters who just have been turned off by um, the Prime Minister, and that doesn't seem to have changed much th through the course of the campaign. What the, what the, the hope for the, the government is that is there is some truth to, to their narrative. It does ring true to people that these are unprecedented times and who knows what the future holds. And um, the hope for the government is, is still that lack of definition around Anthony Albanese and, and what, who he is and what he's going to do. Now, we've seen a slight improvement in that through the course of the campaign, but still that's their hope. It still is a leap of faith for people to, to change government in this time. Are they turned off enough by the government to make a, to want to make that, that leap of faith? Well, the, the, certainly the quantitative polling would suggest they are at the moment. And um, But there is still that risk. There's still that uncertainty about the future and the, that uncertainty around Labor. And that's a question we often quantify. It's a kind of the defining question, I suppose. Is there a mood for change? Mm, yeah, it's a really Do interesting question. Do you care to question. answer that? Uh, Look, I, I mean, Peter hinted at then. I think we're, we're, we're it just, it's still too, um, anything can happen in the last two weeks. We, the, probably the main thing we get, we get a sense of at the moment is that people have switched off. Um, swinging voters, have, it's really in the middle of the campaign now. They know how it's going to play out, that one side's going to say one thing, the other side's going to say the other. They're going to have all these planned campaign events and it's kind of become a bit of a haze in, in the background. So the, the extent to which um, they're tuning in and, and taking um, politicians you know, seriously and at their word and it's influencing them, we think it's a bit limited at the moment, but the last days, the last week of that campaign is going to be really important. But your know, mood for change might be going too far. It's not a kind of a classic mood for change, but you would have to say that things are going in the right direction and so for, for, the, for Labor at the moment and the fundamentals behind the numbers um, need to change for the government to change swinging voters' minds. Peter, you've, I mean, that t basically reflects what you were saying a moment ago, and you're nodding their head there a lot, but there are a few wild cards still to play out. And the Teal Independents on the left are one of them. That's the independents running against uh, sitting Liberal MPs in, in traditional Liberal heartland. Um, and also there's also the minor parties, the UAP, Clive Palmer, and One Nation on the right. We've seen some polling today, the Australia Institute polling in the seat of Goldstein, which is a blue ribbon Liberal seat with Tim Wilson, the sitting member, Zoe Daniel, the Teal Independent running against him, suggests they're neck and neck on primaries, which would give um, the Teal Independent, Zoe Daniel, a big lead, ultimately, uh, at the end of counting. How do you see... There's been a few of these seat polls. Can we make any judgement from them? I think any individual seat poll is fraught, but the trend in all the polling in these seats is that the... The primary vote, which is really linked to name recognition of independent candidates, is on the rise. I think it's a massive disruption to the coalition's preferred strategy of just running safe pair of hands because they've got some of the key members of their team, including the Treasurer, fighting for their political lives. In terms of UAP, I think the atmospherics are different than 2019 when the last few weeks it was effectively a campaign against Bill Shorten. From what I've seen of the UAP, they're really reinforcing interest rates as an issue with a bit of very unfriendly fire at the Prime Minister personally in some newspaper ads. So, again, that could well play out differently. But to Tony's point, 
elections are decided in the final couple of weeks. So we sit here highly engaged, trying to look at, read the tea leaves and wonder what's going to happen yet next. All we can look at is the settings. And it just appears on our numbers that Labor has a strong platform to launch into those final two weeks, while the coalition, to me, seems all at sea. And Tony, just a brief one from you again, from those people you've been listening to in the focus groups. Uh, I, I've hear, I, I notice in a lot of Vox Pops, people say, oh, I might go to Pauline Hanson because she, you know, means what she says. Uh, I mean, are you, what sort of sentiment are you getting towards independents and minor parties? Well, the, the sentiment that, that independents primarily um, draw from is that anti-politician thing, that I'm sick of politicians, you know, they all lie, none of them can be trusted, they're all in it for self-interest. That has currency across the board um, with any with all swinging voters, whether they end up voting Labor, Liberal or whoever. It's just you get a segment of people who've had enough. Um, and there might be particular issues in their particular electorate or particular issues like climate change is a big issue for a lot of these um, independents that, that they'll be drawn to. Um, so that's a really deep sentiment that we've seen for a long time. And, and that's the main thing that that um, independents are able to draw on. Look, we're out of time, but Tony, just a quick one from you. I'm not sure if you've got many young voters around those tables there, but it seems to me the youth vote is sitting there and neither party is making much of a pitch. Are you hearing much from young people around those tables? Um, look, it, it, it's not massively different issues with young right. people. It, it's the economy and it's cost of living and it's it's, it's those sorts of things that um, are just as concerning to them. And, you know, they're, they're at a different okay. life stage but just as concerning to them as they are in a different way and, you know, they manifest themselves in different ways, but it's cost of living, the economy, um, the future of jobs that are, are really important to them. All right. Tony Mitchell and Peter Lewis, thanks so much for joining us again here on Afternoon Briefing. Thank you. Pleasure. All right. Well, we are drawing towards the close of afternoon briefing for today, Fran, but time for a couple of final observations. I'm always fascinated to listen to the pollsters because behind all of their caution, their reluctance to say anything that might be taken as predictive, a couple of things struck me in today's conversation. One, people have switched off, says Tony Mitchellmore, but also on interest rates, uh, this will be met as a sense of dread for those who already felt like they were, you know, on the breadline. Well, there are many hundreds of thousands of people with mortgages who've never had an interest rate rise, so mm. this will be, and, and many of those have taken out their mortgage in the last couple of years when the Reserve Bank was suggesting no rate rises to 2024, so this will be a shock to some of those people, that's for sure, but I think the most important statement we've heard today, Greg, was from the Reserve Bank Governor when he said firmly at the beginning that this, the election had had no impact on this rate rise decision and, you know, the Reserve Bank will always do what they think is in the best interest of the country. And that's reassuring, I suppose, as an institution. Yeah. It, so many of them get trashed in this day and age, but it is important that, I suppose, the head of an institution gets out there and defends that principle. I think it's critical. Independence, yep. All right, so, uh, yeah, that was uh, Philip Lowe who started our our coverage today and it really was as we said at the outset a frenetic pace right off the top <laughs> with so many uh, people wanting to put their voice on the record it was the Prime Minister and Josh Frydenberg and before him Jim Chalmers so hopefully we've covered all the bases for you on ABC News this afternoon but much more coming up in just a moment and of course Fran and I will both be back with you again same time tomorrow on Afternoon Briefing we'll see you then see you then Coming up on Q&A.